Thank you everyone for your patience. Welcome to the next GIF <laughs> webinar series. Today's presentation on international knowledge management and preservation of sodium fast reactors is a panel discussion of some of our um, experts in the field. Dr. Patricia Pavier is our moderator for this panel discussion. She is the National Technical Director of the DOE Molten Salt Reactor Program. She's also the chair of the GIF Education and Training Working Group. Previously, she was the director of the Office of Materials and Chemistry Technologies at DOE, the Office of Nuclear Energy, responsible for R&D activities at the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. She has over 25 years of innovative R&D and has worked in government, ac academia, industry, national laboratories. She earned her PhD in radiochemistry from the University Paris Orsay in France. Patricia? Yes, thank you so much. Course. Thank you, Bertha, for the introduction. So I'm very happy to have Joël Guides uh, with us uh, this morning. It was a challenge, but uh, we, we made it. So Joël is through his phone. He doesn't have a computer right now. So Mr. Joël Guides graduated from Ecole Centrale de Paris in 1973. Over his career, he was the head of several activities on Phoenix, Super Phoenix, and Osiris at the CEA in France, as well as responsible of the high flux reactor in Petten, Netherlands. And he was the nuclear representative at the French Embassy in Berlin, Germany. Since his retirement in 2020, Mr. Guides has been a scientific advisor of several startup companies, a member of a symposium committee, honorary president of SFN ST7, writer of articles, and scientific lecturer. His book entitled Fast Reactors, a solution to fight against global warming was published in September by Elsevier Edition. So without any delay, uh, Joël, I give you the floor and thank you very much to volunteer to be our first panelist today. Okay, I be begin in this case. You hear me well, it's okay? Yes, it's okay. Thank you, Joël. Okay. So we will speak, I will speak on the European feedback experience on the sodium fast reactor, and we will speak on the transmission for the future. First, the next slide, the European experience on the sodium fast reactor. Do you remember that in the year 17, several sodium fast reactors were built in Europa, in Germany, in the UK, and also in France with Rhapsody and Phoenix. But in the year 80, only France continued with European partners that continued the sodium fast reactor. The Super Phoenix reactor was an European reactor with 30% from Italy and 16% from other countries. After the, during the operation of Super Phoenix, a project called EFR, European Fast Reactor, was um, began with five countries. Recently, but this project will stop, had been stopped when, when Super Phoenix was stopped. Recently, we have in France the Astrid project, 600 mega, megawatts, that was to read from, from 2010 to 2019, after we, uh, no, no, build, no construction was made for this reactor. And then we have the European project OSFR Smart that began from 2017 to 2022. It was a continuation of the European Fast Reactor. Uh, each four years, we continue this project to evaluate this project at the best uh, status without of the knowledge. Now, today, a new European project called OSFR Simple began next year, uh, the following OSFR Smart. Next slide, please. We arrived to the Phoenix feedback experience. The Phoenix reactor 2050 megawatts, ethical megawatts, was operated from 73 to 2009. There was an industrial demonstration of reprocessing 
in the manufacture of new fuel with the produce obtained by reprocessing. The feedback experience of this reactor is resumed in the book that you can see on the slide. It's a book that was produced in French and after traduced in English. Next slide, please. We arrive now to the Super Phoenix feedback experience. Super Phoenix remains today the biggest sodium fast reactor never built and never operated in the world. Uh, today it is a BN 800 megawatts in Russia, that is the biggest uh, reactor operated. Super Phoenix was 1,200 megawatts. It was operated only 11 years. Uh, 1986 to 1996, we had a very strong political opposition in France from ecologists, and it was stopped on political decision after one year of final good operation. After the time, the reactor was stopped waiting from administrative authorization to be able to restart. This book summarizes the feedback experience of this reactor. Next slide, please. The fast reactors are ecological in comparison of water reactors. That is very important because with fast reactors, we have no need of uranium mines because we operate the reactor with waste. We have no need of enrichment factories of this uranium. The operation of the plant can be made during several thousand years using only waste from water reactors. The waste are the depleted uranium and the plutonium issued from reprocessing. We have the possibilities in this reactor to burn all the mineral actinides. That it is a fact that final waste from the sodium fast reactor cycles are short life waste, easy to store and manage. The reactor is safer in operation because there is no pressure in the circuit. There is no release at all, liquid or gaseous during the operation of the plant, and you have better dosimetry for the workers, because it's a reactor that is never open, so there is no dosimetry problem. So we have some references in the presentation. Next slide, please. But the problem is that the sodium fast reactors are more expensive. The cost of the reactor itself is estimated of about 30% more than the cost of a water reactor classical. And we have also the prototype effect. For the first reactors, the cost is highlighted. For example, for Super Phoenix, the final cost was 2.2 the cost of a classical water reactor. The first reactors are interesting if you have all the fuel cycle in place. So you need to have a reprocessing plant for the burnout fuel and a factory to manufacture new fuel sub assemblies with the material recovered during the reprocessing. So all that makes a big investment and not only for the reactor, but also for the reprocessing and the fuel manufacturing units during a long period of time and in the continuous political support is needed. The political and ecological advantage will arrive later and after several decades, and though it's difficult to have a political support at short term. Next slide, please. What is the future for the sodium fast reactor of the world? In the United States, the demonization of plutonium during the Carter administration has stopped the reprocessing and though has stopped also the fast reactor. Because if we don't reprocess, we don't have plutonium, and without plutonium, it's impossible to have the cycle of fast reactor. The political support for nuclear energy can change, and it's difficult to change, obtain continuous support for decades for EV investment without quick return for the position in charge. It was a problem you have had in France. And other problems, two countries have reprocessing plants in operation, and the few countries are able to, to, pro, to support uh, sodium fast reactor cycle. Storing user fuel in pools has no ecological future, but is a low, less expensive at short term. 
And also, today we have a cost of uranium that is low, and so it's not, uh, it doesn't help to support the sodium phosphorator. Do we have some hope for the future? We never know. When uranium will become rare or expensive, some countries will perhaps come back to the utilization of their waste already available. When some ecologists will fight against long life nuclear waste accumulation, perhaps they will help the sodium phosphorator that can suppress all this waste. And with the passive safety of plants, without pressure, enabled to support by natural convection accident as Fukushima will be explained. Perhaps we have a better social acceptance. It's difficult at political, political level, but we never know. And the reason that we try in Europa countries to continue to have the programs year after year to maintain competencies and to have uh, to have possibility to build a reactor the day of the political support we arrive. Next slide, please. We arrive to the ECFS smart principle. The ECFS smart principle was to increase the safety by simplification of the reactor. It was a four years project, European project, that was closed in 2022. The principle of the studies was to increase the safety of the affair reactor design initial to be in accordance with the less safety rules issued from Fukushima experience. All the reactor designs were reviewed to be safer, but without any dedicated tool to respond to the accident. This type, this type of dedicated tools make the reactor more complex, more difficult to operate, and at the end, less safe. We apply the, practical, the principle of practical elimination to see all the possible accidents and to suppress them by dedicated design. And the work was very easier due to the big feedback experience of the surface reactor and the knowledge of all the possible accidents in this type of reactor. Next slide, please. The ECFA Smart is a reactor passive and easy to operate. The reactor can shut down without any order with passive control routes when the physical parameter, as for example, the outlet sodium temperature increase. The natural convection with sodium secondary loop allows to re the removal of uh, residual power by natural convection with air. The passive system allows only by natural convection of air and sodium to cool the reactor in case of all the secondary loops are drained. We have passive thermal pumps to have a good flow rate in all the circuits totally passively and without any order. And the start of the reactor is very easy. We have no poison, no bore regulation, no pressure in the reactor, no pressure in the circuit. And the general operation of the reactor is very simple. Next slide, please. We have a better mitigation of, of severe accidents on the CFR smart. The new safety rules for the reactor is that in case of severe accident taken as an obligatory work hypothesis, it should be no radioactive release around the reactor in the short and long term. The CFR smart designed a lot to satisfy this rule. First, even if the main vessel has a leak, the pit designed allows to support the sodium leak and to assure by natural convection in the core the residual power evacuation. The decayed removal is assured at short and long term by passive circuits out of the vessel and not damaged during the accident. The design conception Think metallic roof components fixed and welded on the roof allows to avoid any leakage of primary sodium, even in case of overpressure in the vessel. If the core is melted, the core catcher and special device inside the core assure the management of the melted core. This melted core is uh, cooled by natural convection also. And the decade removal of the metal core is made by natural convection inside the pool. 
So we have a good situation after a hypothetical severe accident. We have a good mitigation of the reactor. Next slide, please. So a surface map design is safer. That's the first design of EFR, but cheaper also. We have no more safety vessel, no more costly exchanger inside the primary vessel, no more dome or polar table above the primary vessel. A simple sink metallic roof with no need of cooling of synchronic protection. We have striped pipes with, that gives a gain of 50% on the secondary pool, uh, secondary loops and the secondary building. And we have the same chimney for the DRHS1 uh, system and for the steam generator casing. You see on the design on the web the view of the reactor that is very uh, we gain a lot of place and a lot of volume for secondary loop. It is uh, very interesting because uh, the cost is cheaper than the uh, design of EFR. To read more, it's a very, it's a very uh, rapid uh, explanation of an EFR smart. If you want to read more on a secret smart design, you can read the ASM Journal of Nuclear Engineering and Radiation. It was a special issue dedicated to a Sefer Smart. And you have all the, uh, all the explanation on the project and on the pre-calculation of the project. There is a webinar I made in 2022 that is available. So it was a one hour web, web, webinar on a Sefer Smart with a lot of explanation. And you have my new book, Elsevier, publication published in September 22, dedicated on the chapter 6. We have a 14 page dedicated to a safer smart. Next slide, please. The next European program is a safer simple. The program has begun. The program begun with all the a safer smart options. Some R&D will be initiated on the bellows, on the thermal pumps, on the pit structure, and we, we continue to validate the options. The design will be reviewed with a lower power, and uh, we have our, we try to make a reactor that we can build in a factory, and so we try to have a nine meter diameter for the primary vessel to be built in factory. And with this diameter, we arrive to a reactor of 400 megawatts. So this program is well engaged, and uh, we have now the first year uh, results of this program. Next slide, please, this is the conclusion. <coughs> the sodium fast reactors are more ecological than the pressurized water reactors. We have no need for uranium, no need for uranium enrichment. The operation is using waste already available, and the final nuclear waste of short life is it managed. They are more expensive and need a continuous investment during several decades for the countries involved. And short term and with the museum at low cost, there is no hope today of an initial project before the end of the century in Europe. And the European project allows small teams of experts from different countries to remain involved and to have a global common approach and project after project, we improve the design and the knowledge of a new reactor. A significant part of the project is dedicated to the dissemination of this knowledge for the young people and the young students. And all this work allows, if the positive work, positive political decisions arrive one day, to restart the project quickly and with the best design available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I see we have uh, one question, but we will ask all the questions at the end of uh, the presentations. So now we're yes. going to give the floor to uh, our next speaker for today, uh, Mr. Yes. Ron Onberg. Good morning, Ron. So Dr. Ron Onberg graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a PhD in nuclear engineering 
1969, and he's currently serving as a principal technical advisor at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the United States. Since 2000, Dr. Amberg has been responsible for the Fast Flux Test Facility Knowledge Preservation Program for the DOE Office of Nuclear Energy at PNNL. He worked on the design of the FFTF and uh, Westinghouse Hanford from 1970 to 1980. He participated in the International Nuclear Fuel Cycle Evaluation from 1976 to 1980, as well as in the United States Soviet Union Cooperative Threat Reduction Program between 1999 to 2009. He's also served as a member of DOENE, Nuclear Energy Advisory Committee, Subcommittee on Infrastructure from 2000 to 2020. So without any delay, Ron, I give you the floor. Again, thank you very much for presenting this uh, webinar. Well, well, thank you, Patricia. Let me verify that I'm not double and triple muted here and that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and I'm pleased to be here uh to talk on behalf of the pacific northwest national laboratory and the office of nuclear energy and the department of energy and the subject is as you see on the screen fftf knowledge management and preservation and i'll talk to you how we went about it let me click and make sure i can advance slides here uh here's my first slide uh this is four and a half years into construction i joined ffTf in I joined it four and a half years into construction. I joined FFTF uh, in September of 69. Uh, construction began in June of 1970. Um, and when I look at this picture, it actually amazes me to some extent, uh, actually more than to some extent. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but here's the dump heat exchangers over on the right and on the left, uh, here's containment. Uh, the lid is on containment now. If I had a picture of this a year earlier, we'd see Manitoc cranes on the site and equipment was being lifted into containment um, through uh, the lid that was not on through the opening at the top. And after the lid was on, everything that went in and out of containment went through the equipment hatch. And our objective here on preserving the knowledge is to be able to do something like this in four and a half years again. Uh, and not have to reinvent anything that was previously invented and be able to create a project and a, and a reactor that looks like this in four and a half years. It's something that isn't easy to do. I will go to the next slide here. You see the picture of the reactor as it was operated. Uh, you see things that, you know, we don't see that the core is this cute little thing down here, okay? Uh, the reactor plant is lot larger in the core, as you might guess. Here's the dump heat exchangers over here on the right. Here's the fuel storage facility over on the left. Here's the bottom loading transfer cast that uh, moves fuel back and forth. Uh, here's the ex vessel handling machine, which we call the CLEM. Uh, primary pumps here. Uh, major milestones up above. Sodium fill, which was a major milestone July to December 1978. Criticality, February 1980. Power operation, December 1980. End of operation, March uh, 1992. So it ran a little over 10 years before it was shut down. Now let's go to the next slide and we'll start to talk about what knowledge we're preserving. Over here on the left, uh, you see an instrumented, instrumented test assembly. You, I see the instrument leads coming out. So we have a radiation test data. We have the design of the of the test assemblies, the fabrication of them, uh, the irradiation of them, and the information that was obtained by irradiating them. We preserve all that. In the center, you see uh, the top face of the core before sodium fill. And to the right, you see the dump heat exchangers again, an engineering marvel all by themselves. Uh, we save the design documentation, uh, the operating information, operation operating on maintenance manuals, drawings, um, everything that would be required to just build one again. 
if I go to the next slide, I will show how we say this information. So the question was how to organize. <clears throat> so the knowledge consists of, for FFT, about 80,000 drawings. So I think it's 83,000 to be exact, 500,000 records. They're almost all hard copies. Um, I, most people don't remember what a mylar drawing is, but the drawings are largely on mylar. Mm -hmm. They can act, actually, I see somebody, I hear somebody laughing there. So somebody knows what a mylar drawing is. <laughs> they can be up to size F, which is like, you know, 34 to 48 inches high and 17 feet long. Uh, they're located in multiple record holding areas on the Hanford site. We don't have a single one, we have multiple ones. And so the question is, or was, how to organize this and make it most useful? Well, Chris Grandy at Argonne and I talked and we talked back and forth and, and I'm not sure who came up with this idea. Maybe one of us did, maybe both of us did. Uh, we came up with a lessons learned approach in order to organize this information. And so the question is, what is a lessons learned approach? Uh, and here's the value of it. It can focus on knowledge preservation for a timely issue, gather that information and documentation that's needed uh, relative to the issue. It can identify what was done well, given what what was known at the time. And it, sometimes I'm amazed at how well things were done given what was known at the time. Can likewise identify what could have been done better given what we know now. And as we all know, thinking back, you can always think about how you could have done something better. And that is written down and documented. And all supporting documentation or relevant documentation is located, retrieved, digitized or scanned and attached. So the drawings, the, the test designs, the operating manuals, the maintenance manuals are likewise co-located um, and attached. And it's performed by people with firsthand uh, experience, not necessarily Ron Ombrick here, but the guys who actually did it. And I'm very grateful to them for contributing to their to their their knowledge um, and they are the ones who essentially make the lessons learned what they really are and we doing so we incorporate undocumented knowledge and experience not everything is written down in a test design description not everything is written down in an operating manual but how well those things worked at the time is likewise written up by these people uh, when we uh, uh, document a lesson learned on a subject of relevance. So how do we do this? Well, we pick a topic. Uh, they differ depending on the year. Uh, CRDMs, control rod drive mechanisms was one case. Shield design was another. Argon 14 management was another. Thermal transient usage was another. B4C swelling and uh, control rods. Uh, with another, thermal striping with another. And these are written up by the people who did the work at the time, that are experts at the time, and now thankfully are willing to contribute that knowledge uh, to, to future programs. So what do we write to when we do it? And we have like a four part uh, syllabus here to write to. Uh, write down what did we do? And we write down why is or was it important. We write down what's the outcome. And then the most interesting part, if we had to do it over, what would we change and do differently? And we write it down. A lesson learned report is on the order of a dozen pages and so easily readable. And the key takeaways are summarized. All references are digitized and so electronic. And how many lesson learned reports do we do? If I can get the next slide here. Uh, this hardly fits on the screen. Um, here's the lessons learned report we have done over the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, over on the left, when we have more funding and we're doing the easier ones, we do more. Over on the right, when we have less funding and we're doing the harder ones, we do fewer. But each and every year, we try to do as many as we have funding for and, uh, and, and can support. And we really thank our sponsors that they uh, contribute to this year in and year out. 
And in the end, I think we have like 40 lessons learned reports or so. And you see the subjects here. And so now I, sh I should acknowledge the people who made this possible. And so for support and funding over the years, uh, I'd like to thank Alice Caffaniti, Office of Nuclear Energy, Brian Robinson, Office of Nuclear Energy. Uh, he's replaced by Kat now. Uh, also, Bo Fang at Argonne, Chris Grandy at Argonne, Bob Hill at Argonne. And also encouragement and support from Tom O'Connor on the Versatile Test Reactor, DUE NE, Office of Nuclear Energy, and Frank Goldner on the Versatile Test Reactor, uh, Office of Nuclear Energy. And I believe that might be my last slide. Yes, it is my last slide. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, it's a great presentation on knowledge management and what we're doing in the United States. So we're gonna jump and fly to Japan I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Iwoki Ayafune. He serves as the Deputy Director General, Sector of Fast Reactor and Advanced Reactor R&D at the Japanese Atomic Energy Agency. He joined JAEA in 1988 and has participated in Manju and SFR developments. Mr. Ayafune is recognized as a subject matter expert in advanced reactor design. So without any delay, uh, you have the floor. Hiroki, thank you so much again. I know it's late in Japan. Thank you very much. Good, e Good evening. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Okay. Uh, I introduced the knowledge management and the preservation from Joyo, Monju, and the JSFR experiment. This title includes three name of the reactor. Joyo is a uh, experimental reactor in uh, ORI engineering center. And uh, uh, I tell the short uh, status of the uh, Joyo uh, shortly. Uh, Joyo have a uh, uh, license uh, uh, from the authority this, uh, this month. So uh, we get the license. So uh, uh, Next few years, we will modify the, some systems and uh, we will restart Joyo. And the next one, Monju. Monju is a demo, uh, prototype reactor and uh, unfortunately it's uh, uh, in the decommissioning now. Uh, all the fuel is uh, moved to the uh, ex uh, outside of the vessel and the uh, uh, decommissioning uh, operation will be continued. And the last one, JSFR. JSFR is a former our uh, demonstration reactor development program. Um, it uh, uh, started uh, 2005, and uh, uh, after the big earthquake in Japan, uh, it is freezed. Uh, but uh, uh, we uh, already have the five years development for JSFR, so. Uh, these uh, Joyo, Monju, and uh, JSFR have a, a, a lot of uh, uh, knowledge. So we, uh, how to, I introduce how to manage uh, this uh, knowledge and uh, uh, knowledge today. Next slide, please. Uh, problems is uh, uh, on this slide, and the uh, background is uh, uh, already I uh, introduced. Uh, Problem is a uh, uh, previous knowledge from the SFR development were uh, being impaired uh, because uh, 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 after the Monj development, uh, we spent uh, 30, years, uh, 30 years. So uh, many people are retired and uh, uh, no uh, well uh, experienced person uh, is uh, there's uh, very few in this uh, time. And the uh, other uh, important point is the supply chain. Uh, for example, uh, uh, crowding of the uh, SFR uh, fuel, uh, that is a, a very fine tube, but uh, uh, after the Monge shutdown, uh, that uh, is uh, not uh, produced in the industry. So we should restart 
uh, that the industry uh, production uh, method uh, it should be uh, recovered. Uh, that is a, a large problem for, for the future SFR development. Next slide, please. And uh, I introduce uh, examples uh, from these uh, pages. And uh, SFR uh, research and development knowledge uh, to be uh, preserved is uh, uh, shown this uh, slide. Important point is uh, uh, in the design uh, knowledge, design standards and the safety standards. These two are very, very important for the future because uh, uh, that is the uh, ba basis of the uh, future reactor development. And uh, uh, also next one is the R&D knowledge. Uh, we uh, already have a, a lot of experiment, experiments in the past. Uh, so uh, experimental data, uh, this is a, a basis of the design and the basis of the safety. Uh, these are very, very important also for the future. And the uh, uh, evaluation code and the ex experimental techniques, uh, that is also important. Uh, our uh, knowledge is uh, uh, inside of the ex evaluation codes and uh, uh, in the SFR development, especially uh, we need a, a sodium experiment and the experimental techniques uh, for the uh, sodium experiment, that is a, uh, that know-how is uh, in the humans. So oh, these are also uh, very important. And uh, in the right-hand right side, uh, that is an um, industry uh, side uh, problem. Uh, fabrication and construction and operation and maintenance and the decommissioning. Uh, these are uh, also uh, uh, difficult uh, problem in the future. Next slide, please. And I introduce real uh, examples. Uh, steam generator tube design. Uh, that is a uh, very uh, difficult point of the SFR design. And uh, in the left hand side, uh, I show the uh, figure of the uh, steam generator inside. Uh, tube uh, of the steam tube is uh, inside of the sodium. So if the uh, steam tube is uh, uh, failed. Uh, very high pressure steam will be uh, uh, penetrated into the sodium. And uh, in this situation, uh, steam jet uh, have a, a chemical uh, reaction and uh, uh, um, chemical reaction uh, make a uh, heat. So uh, thermal, uh, thermal uh, effect, and uh, also uh, very high-speed jet make uh, make a mechanical uh, impact for the uh, neighbor uh, uh, tubes. So uh, if we don't have the uh, safety system, uh, protection system, uh, uh, that steam jet will be a failed neighbor. Uh, Last slide, please. Uh, and uh, neighbor uh, tubes. So in this uh, situation, uh, we have a uh, steam generator design and depend on the uh, experimental correlations. Uh, correlations show, show in the uh, left-hand side uh, view graph. And uh, one plot is a one experiment, and uh, we have a, a huge number of experiment was uh, uh, carried out, and uh, this curve is uh, best uh, used for the uh, steam generator design. Um, but uh, uh, this, in this case, uh, tube tube design is uh, uh, very fixed because the parameter range is uh, very small. So uh, outside of the parameter, we cannot design the tubes. So uh, this is the uh, problem for the future uh, design. So we need uh, uh, mechanic, me mechanistic 
a theory-based analysis. Uh, this is a, uh, instead of the uh, experimental correlations. So uh, now we try to develop the mechanistic theory-based analysis uh, method. Next slide, please. And this is a uh, mechanistic uh, analysis uh, co uh, system uh, development. And uh, this, uh, in the center of the uh, figure, show the uh, steam jet into the uh, sodium. And uh, this have a chemical reaction and the thermal effect and the uh, mechanical effect for the neighbor. Uh, neighbor tubes. And uh, these are all the uh, modeled uh, in the uh, Seraphim code and uh, that have a March fluid model uh, and uh, surface reaction model. That is a chemical reaction model and the gas phase reaction model. These are uh, all included in a code and uh, uh, we uh, very preciously analyze the uh, 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 steam water uh, reaction uh, in the, the steam generator. Uh, that is a one example uh, from correlation to uh, design by analysis. Next slide, please. Next uh, uh, example is a uh, uh, knowledge from uh, trouble in Monju. Uh, Monju have a sodium leakage accident uh, in the uh, uh, 20 years ago, maybe. And uh, that uh, occurred by the uh, vortex uh, vibration uh, for the uh, temperature measurement system, uh, thermocouples. And uh, uh, in that case, uh, vortex is a sh symmetric vortex is occurred in uh, around the uh, temperature measurement system, uh, thermocouples. And uh, uh, at that time, we don't have the uh, design guideline for the uh, symmetric vortex. As a vortex, we have uh, the design guideline. Uh, but uh, after the uh, Monge trouble, uh, we uh, try to get the design guideline for the uh, symmetry vortex. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the uh, design guideline. Uh, for the uh, symmetry vortex. And uh, in the uh, American uh, mechanical uh, ASME have also uh, same kind of guideline and uh, JSME also uh, we uh, established the uh, guideline for the uh, design. And that, uh, that uh, trouble is uh, uh, people uh, forget the uh, phenomena, but uh, uh, this guideline will be exist in the future. So we uh, protect from the uh, these kind of the uh, troubles. Uh, that is a uh, one example. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next one is a large component replacement in Joyo. This is a uh, real. Uh, uh, operation of the uh, operation uh, of the in in the Joyo reactor uh, in Joyo uh, damp heat exchanger and also IH intermediate heat exchanger that will be uh, that have been uh, replaced in the Joyo and uh, uh, that is a uh, uh, first case of the uh, in Japan uh, large used. Uh, component is removed and the new one is a uh, uh, replaced uh, case. So this is a very, very uh, precious uh, experiment in the uh, uh, sodium reactor development. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, operation uh, are uh, very uh, um, um, to make uh, uh, this operation to a knowledge, uh, we make a, a lot of uh, uh, documents and uh, we keep uh, this knowledge to the futures. Next slide, please. Uh, 
next one is the uh, uh, sodium treatment technique in the human. Uh, sodium is a, a very uh, chemical uh, have a chemical activities for so for uh, water and the air. Uh, so uh, we need uh, some uh, uh, education and uh, training for the uh, operators. So we have the uh, these uh, facilities, uh, sodium loop for the training and the uh, sodium tr uh, treatment training course and the sodium fire extinction uh, training. Uh, these are uh, in the uh, Tsuruga area of the JEE facility. Uh, and the continuation, continuous training and education, uh, this is a uh, sub to the uh, JEE operator and also for the uh, foreign researcher and uh, operators. In, in this case, uh, figure show the uh, uh, center of the uh, picture it showed uh, uh, not a uh, Japanese uh, uh, operator, but uh, this is a uh, people from uh, Asian countries. Uh, so this uh, training course is uh, open uh, open to the uh, world in JEA. Next slide, please. So uh, how to manage the uh, manage and preserve the knowledge. This is a, a program a program for the future. So uh, we have a lot of r and result and uh, some uh, analysis method and uh, design standards and guidelines uh, uh, in the past. Uh, that is a, uh, we, uh, a lot of knowledge we have, but uh, it's not enough for the future design use because of uh, uh, this is an um, uh, independent uh, design standard, design guideline, and uh, uh, codes and uh, R&D result. So we need some uh, combination of this uh, knowledge. So uh, we think uh, design support system uh, that is uh, required in the future plant designs uh, with the previous knowledge. Uh, that is a very important point. Uh, to support designers in the uh, evaluation and design, and uh, to support verification and uh, validation of new medic numerical analysis. That is a uh, point of, of the design support system. And uh, now uh, JEA developing the Arcadia system uh, for the uh, such kind of design support system. Next slide, please. Arcadia system is uh, consist of uh, three uh, system mainly. One is a knowledge system. That is a, a database, a knowledge base of the uh, previous experiment and uh, some knowledges. And uh, uh, one part is a uh, analysis system. This is a, a, a analytical uh, code system. And the uh, last one is the evaluation system. This is a, a, some uh, uh, design optimization and uh, some uh, 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 design optimization is uh, um, this decided in this uh, system. These three parties are uh, co uh, with a combination uh, and uh, uh, Operated in the same system, so uh, we have the automatically use the knowledge and automatically use the uh, know-how for the design and uh, uh, automatically use the anal analysis system. This is a uh, very uh, important for the uh, future SFR design. Uh, maybe Arcadia is now uh, we developing. And after uh, two or three years, we have the, some uh, uh, prototype uh, system. And uh, after maybe maybe after uh, five years, we can use for the real uh, uh, use for the real uh, reactor designs. Next slide, please. Uh, 
And this is a uh, knowledge management system in Arcadia. Uh, so uh, skip this page. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the last slide. Uh, knowledge management. Uh, knowledge management uh, and the preservation is uh, important for the future SFR development. Um, now we developed the Arcadia system. Uh, this is a design support system for the future uh, SFR development. And also education uh, training is uh, also important for the uh, future uh, human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Iroki, for the excellent presentation on what's going on in Japan. So now we are going to move with two developers, and they're going to tell us about their design and maybe how they learn um, from lessons learned from other countries and documents. So I'm very happy to have uh, Mr. Carl Doucet with us uh, this morning. Uh, he is uh, working with Arc Clean Energy in Canada and has over 30 years of engineering experience in the petrochemical, wood products, air pollution control, solvent recycling, telecommunication, consulting engineering, and nuclear industries. Most recently, Mr. Doucet served as the design engineering section head and system responsible operations specialist with the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. In addition, Cal was the project manager for emergency core cooling strainer installations, lead engineer for the NRU vessel leak repair project, and responsible for the processing of legacy liquid waste through the CNL liquid waste immobilization system. Mr. Doucet earned his Bachelor of Chemical Engineering degree from McGill University in Canada. Without any delay, you have the floor, Carl. Again, thank you so much for uh, being here and presenting uh, your, uh, your interesting presentation. Thank you. Hello, all. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, yes, my presentation is about the ARC-100 uh, uh, sodium fast reactor uh, and uh, taking advantage of our previous presenter's knowledge base that is available and how it, uh, we've used it to uh, advance the design of the ARC-100. I don't know if I have control of the slides. Next slide, please. Okay, so incorporating the operating, operating experience. Why sodium fast reactors? This is my presentation. Sodium fast reactors 101, collecting and sharing experience, SMR technology and evolution, the Canadian example, what we're doing here, can do evolutionary path, the genesis of the ARC, the ARC evolutionary path, and the ARC 100 design overview, what we're trying to build. Next slide. So, why sodium fast reactors? Well, sodium fast reactors have inherent safety characteristics, uh, power control characteristics, exceptional load following characteristics. They offer uh, energy flexibility, versatile, versatility departure with new renewables in the new uh, economy. Uh, they can be used for electricity generation, thermal uh, uh, heat for industry, uh, paired with hydrogen production. Uh, the, the applications are endless. Next slide, please. So, sodium fast reactors 101, for those who are not uh, conversant. Uh, so, the SFR uses liquid sodium as a reactor coolant, allowing operation at low pressure, reducing the driving force for offsite dose. Much of the basic technology for the SFR has been established in former fast reactor programs. So, this is not a first of a kind technology, and, and we need to constantly thank uh, the people who came before us for recording all that information down. High level of safety achieved through inherent passive means with significant safety margins. And sodium fast reactors with superheated steam are ideal for electrical grid industrial heat applications that create a broad market opportunities. Uh, from the Generation 4 International Forum, uh, 
When developing a reactor, new reactor system, accumulation of experience on fuel safety and material behavior is extremely important and takes a significant amount of time. In the SFR case, those experiences have been successfully accumulated during the past 70 years worldwide. There were an, uh, and are a lot of experimental and prototype SFRs. I spent so much time reading about what was done in the past. Fuel subassembly specifications, safety designs, and materials of future SFRs are based on perspectives from those experiences. From the safety point of view, a lot of large demonstration experiments have been conducted and evaluation tools validated by those experiments have been developed. There is extensive experience based on both experimental and prototype SFRs supporting it as a mature technology. Next slide, please. So, SFR technology is supported by worldwide by a significant number of reactor facilities that were developed from first of a kind through an evolutionary path to demonstration commercial sizes. And there are still uh, reactors running today, sodium fast reactors running successfully today. Uh, this is a, a, a reduced list of what was out there and when it was running and when it was running. Next. So collecting and sharing experience. About 20 fast neutron reactors have already been operating, some since the 50s and some supplying electricity commercially. There's over 400 reactor years of operating experience accumulated that has been documented in OPEX documents. Design information, operating reports, issues, as well as decommissioning information are readily available through the IEA, USDOE, OSD, INL, ORL, and ANL, as well as research papers on various aspects of SFR technology. Uh, fast neutron reactors are a technological step beyond conventional power reactors are poised to become mainstream. Advanced reactor concepts, ARC, was set up in 2006 and has developed a sodium-cooled fast reactor based on the EDR2 design and incorporated lessons learned from the significant past and current operating experience. Next, please. So here's a cross section of SMR technology, micro SMRs through GID scale SMRs, and the sodium cooled fast reactors are right in the mid of middle with generation four advanced reactors. Next, please. So. What's able to be built and what are the characteristics of the uh, SMR technology coming forward? This is a table that explains the uh, characteristics of each of the, uh, and size of each of the, the SMRs that are now being proposed. Next, please. Okay, so when I first got to ARC, I was asked to do a, uh, to look into SFRs and uh, Argonne National Lab did a research and development roadmap for liquid metal cooled fast reactors, saying, taking a look at what's deploy deployable by 2030. And these were the reactors that were identified. The ARC 100 is right in the middle and, uh, uh, and our, our operation date is projected at 2030. Next. Okay, so the genesis of the ARC. The US Department of Energy National Library historically provided technical support to promote and develop of fast reactors in several countries, companies entered into agreements. ARC, Advanced Reactor Concepts, was able to obtain a US government agreement for a scope to support a family of patent applications for a segment of market that matches its mission of small, fast neutron spectrum nuclear power plant with a long refueling interval. Small modular reactors cool sodium cooled reactors with metallic fuel nominally, produce, nominally producing 100 megawatts electric with a range of 50 to 100 megawatts electric and a long core life of approximately 15 to 20 years. The basis for this reactor was aimed at compatibility with smaller grids and smaller capital outlay. The long core life was for energy security and safeguards to facilitate international non-proliferation regime, even for widespread worldwide deployment in developing countries. The secondary pat patent for upgrade to 200 megawatts with the same core and normally half the original core life. 
Canadian application, patent applications had also been filed. Next. So an agreement with between ARC and GEH relating, related to the ARC 100 technology developments for global nuclear power generation, desalination, and industrial heat markets. Recognize that the two reactor designs focus on different objectives and markets. The ARC 100 is a nominal 100 to 200 megawatt SMR, which is designed for efficient and flexible electricity generation, operating for 10 to 20 years. While the GEH prism with a capacity of 165 to 3, 11 megawatts is refilled every 24 months. So the agreement with ARC and GEH allows ARC to leverage the GEH intellectual property to accelerate the ARC preliminary and detailed design. We're working in tight partnership with them. Design has progressed through several regulatory body reviews, uh, USNRC, UK, and now the, the CNSC in Canada. Next. So, how was this developed? Well, it all started off with the, the uh, ALMR, the uh, Advanced Liquid Metal Reactor, that moved on to the GNEP and the probabilistic risk assessment. So uh, you can see the development path of how we got to the PRISM. Next. Now, the interesting part is in Canada, we have the CANDU system, and it was started with it, back in 1945 with the ZEEP, the zero energy pile. I've been in that reactor through the NRX, through NRU, to a nuclear power demonstration CANDU, to the Douglas Point commercial prototype. And you can see it's about a five times scale up, and then a 10 times scale up up to the CANDU sixes and CANDU uh, nines. Next, please. If you look at the ARC 100's evolutionary path, it's incredibly comparable. EBR1 to C4 to FFTF to EBR2 to the ARC 100. It follows the exact same Canadian example with a five times scale up, okay, of, of the previous one. So right now, ARC is building the commercial demonstration unit is in, uh, sorry, in licensing to build the commercial demonstration. Next. So, little review of the ARC 100, uh, 286 megawatts thermal, 100 megawatts electric, uh, core inlet and outlet temperatures of 355 and 510 Celsius, uh, uh, high pressure steam, uh, uh, U10ZR, uh, metallic fuel, taking advantage of all the previous knowledge to pick the middle of the road best safety characteristics. Next. Sodium bonded U10s at our fuel pins, where they're uh, with an active fuel length of about 150 centimeters. Uh, it's comparable to all the previous uh, experience. Uh, there is high rel reliability based on over 100,000 pin irradiated OPEX. Uh, thank you once again for keeping all that data. Uh, next, through FFDF, uh, it has an inherent safety characteristics where unprotected station blackouts, loss of all power to pumps, failure of the RPS to scram the control rods, large negative reactivity from radial expansion and axial expansion feedbacks counters increasing power to flow ratio. Uh, there have been experiments as demonstrated in, by EBR2 of the reactor shutting itself down in, in the case of unprotected station blackout through inherent uh, negative reactivity characteristics. Next. Uh, so unprotected station blackout does not damage the plant. The fuel stays below cladding and eutectic formation, and th this uh, knowledge base is uh, exists to prove this out. Next, beyond design basis accidents, severe accidents that would lead to fuel damage are precluded by the ARC 100 by virtue of self-protecting response of the reactor. 
Anticipated transits without scram do not lead to fuel damage as demonstrated by actual tests in EBR2. Regardless, tests have been undertaken in the treat facility by created a, uh, created a cladding breach with a burst of four times power that also demonstrated strong negative reactivity. In the event of design, design basis accidents, the fuel retains the majority of the fission products. Sodium scrubs a significant, significant amount of those which might be released from fuel. The selection of metallic fuel in combination with lit sodium coolant results in inherently safe characteristics. We maintain a 300 degree margin to boiling with metallic fuel. Next. So load following. Demonstrated uh, an SF, uh, EBR2 demonstrated an SFR with metallic fuel can be passively controlled over a large power range. Simulations have also been done uh, the reactor was able to load follow at 6% of rated power per minute between 100 and 40%. This allows it to match up with uh, renewables extremely well. Next. So this is a, a just a cutaway of our proposed ARC 100 layout right now, where this, the reactor vessel is basically three stories below ground, and the plant is very small. Next. To give an idea of the sound size of the plant, basically uh, a discount warehouse store in St. John, uh, we would be half the size of the store and our exclusion zone would basically be the parking lot. So it's a very small. Now to technology development. So when I first got to ARC, I was asked to do an analysis of the technology readiness level of the ARC 100, and then look at technical optimization activities, uh, engineering partners we're working with, design synergies we can incorporate, and how to, the, the ARC 100 would integrate with energy systems. Next. So uh, a large amount of research was done uh, through the OPEX and historical documents that are made available by the, the previous presenters. And uh, a TRL uh, readiness level was uh, determined for each of the, the uh, critical components of the reactor based on the DOE uh, TRL guide. Next. After much uh, work, uh, we identified each of the, the, the important systems and established a TRL uh, with justification for each of those components. Next. That's the table continued. Next. So there are certain aspects of the sodium pass reactor that uh, could, can be improved with some technical optimization. The primary intermediate loop pumps, the base cases with the cent centrifugal pumps, which have OPEX and a higher TRL level. Options for self-cooled electromagnetic pumps for both the in-vessel and in-line are being done in tandem with uh, natrium and, and GEH, VTR effort to eliminate moving parts. There has already been uh, an EM pump that it, tested that was 6.5 times larger than our need. So down, so this is a downsizing exercise for us. Intermediate loop heat exchangers, uh, for space saving uh, reasons, a kidney shaped heat exchanger would be optimal. So, uh, so once again, this is downsizing because it's already been modeled. Next. Uh, other activities are uh, increasing the instrumentation, uh, fuel assembly flow detection, uh, better instrumentation and more for the uh, demonstration unit. Next. So the TRL assessment, taking a look at everything, came with a base case TRL of 7.3. Optimizing with the optimizations would bring it to about a 6.6 because these 
uh, technologies have not been used in previous reactors. Uh, the licensing and safeguards TRL threshold, sorry, uh, uh, is uh, superior to five due to first time licensing in Canada of this SFR technology. So mitigation activities in progress. The CNSC VDR process is being followed. The New Brunswick Power, which is our site, uh, pre-licensing activities, the CNSC UNS, uh, US NRC co cooperation agreement between the two countries, and the Gen 4 International Forum safety design criteria for SFR technologies has been adopted. adopted. Next, please. So, uh, ARC Clean Technology is, uh, part, is partnering with uh, 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 many engineering partners with different areas of focus based on expertise to bring the project to reality. Next. So design synergy. So it all starts off with EBR2, the Hitachi Prism, the uh, test reactor, and the ARC-100. So basically we're uh, adopting good designs from all of the uh, intellectual property of the different reactors. Next, please. And integrated energy systems. Topping heat may not be necessary for intermediate and high temperature process as a function of the outlet temperature of the selected nuclear reactor technology. So the ARC fits in well with industrial uh, applications, which will allow uh, the decarbonization of industrial uh, industries. If required, topping heat can be added on to increase the temp pressure temperature of the steam, but for a large majority of industries, this is not required. Next. Thank you very much for allowing me to produce the, uh, to present the ARC 100 reactor. And I'd like to once again, thank our previous presenters, uh, Joel, I, I'm enjoying your uh, experience feedback Phoenix 300 page book. Uh, Ron, I'm in touch with uh, uh, Chris Grandy and uh, I've downloaded a bunch of those lessons learned. And Hiroki, uh, yes, we are using your OPEX on uh, thermocouples and uh, steam generator design. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> I pressed the camera at the same time. Thank you very much, uh, Carl, for the excellent presentation. Our last speaker today is uh, Mr. Patrick Alexander. He started his career and developed his passion for the nuclear industry as a reactor operator on a nuclear submarine. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in nuclear energy engineering technology from Thomas Edison State University and a master in engineering management from the University of Texas at Arlington. He joined the commercial nuclear industry at Comanche Peak Nuclear Power Plant as an INC technician and ultimately became a senior reactor operator, shift technical assistant and a qualified chief manager. His passion for the future of nuclear power brought him to Terra Power as principal engineer for operation and where he now serves as the Terra Power operations manager. So Patrick, uh, without any delay, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much again for your presentation. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I'm here to present the natrium plant and what techniques we've used to use past history to develop our plant. So the Natrium plant merges the success of past SFRs with the advancement, advancements of new technology to create an innovative new way to utilize nuclear power. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Natrium plant, and then I'll talk about how we are utilizing those past experiences to realize the future. Next slide, please. Oh, here we go. So what is different about natrium from the current light water reactors? 
Natrium uses compact systems to reduce the nuclear footprint. It uses low pressure systems and more efficient heat transfer. Uh, its pool design reactor with a large coolant inventory eliminates the possibility of a large loss of coolant accident. The energy island and nuclear island separation provide the regulatory gap between nuclear and non-nuclear parts of the plant. And it also allows for parallel construction of the two halves. It's designed to maximize modularity and it has a reduced emergency planning zone, reducing the burden of bulky emergency response requirements. The nature implant will also be operated by less people and be hindered by less regulations than typical light water reactors. All of these differences will drive down costs in both construction and long-term O&M and provide a better economic outlook for the future of nuclear power. Uh, next slide, please. The natrium plant has a protected area, just like typical light water reactors. However, it is vastly reduced in size by placing as many non-nuclear systems outside of it as possible. This helps to reduce the security requirements and allow for easier access to the balance of plant systems for outside contractor work. The separation also eliminates many of the external hazards that current LWRs typically have to account for, such as turbine missile, transformer fires, and seam leaks. To further reduce construction costs, the electrical buildings will be built in prefab E modules that can be stationed throughout the site where they are needed. These prefab structures can be loaded with uh, MCCs and shipped to the site as a whole unit and installed in a relatively short period of time. This reduces the construction time and the number of people required on site during construction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the nuclear island is comprised of four main buildings. The control building, which is where the operators can manage the plant systems. The reactor building, as can be seen in the center of the slide here, which contains the reactor. Uh, the reactor is set below grade to protect against external missile hazards. This eliminates the need for a robust superstructure above grade. The reactor auxiliary building is where the intermediate system transfers heat from the primary system to the salt systems that is then sent to the energy island. And finally, the fuel handling building where the spent fuel is stored before being removed to long-term storage. The fuel handling building keeps all the stored fuel below grade as well to also limit the external hazard, as you can see in the pic pictograph here on the slide. Next slide, please. The energy island is based on a solar plant design, which is proven technology. The number of Number and size of tanks can be adjusted based on the end user needs. The steam generator and turbine sizing can also be customized. The thermal salt storage allows for the electrical load to be varied throughout the day without changing reactor power. This decouples the nu nuclear island from turbine operation, allowing for a turbine to be operated by the grid operator if desired. The thermal salt storage also eliminates or extends the response time needed for the reactor to respond to energy island casualties. The solar salt can also be used for industrial heat applications such as hydrogen production or chemical plants. A single unit can produce approximately a billion BTUs per hour and deliver peak molten salt temperatures ranging from 468 Celsius to 510 degrees Celsius. Um, next slide, please. The Natrium reactor safety features were developed based on previous U US SFR experience, including FFTF. EBR1 and 2 and treat. These include metallic fuel with separate molten salt, energy island, allowing for high fuel compatibility with sodium and eliminating the possibility of sodium water interactions in the steam generators. The passive design of the plant, including the reactor air cooling system, allows for indefinite decay heat removal and no with no reliance on energy island for safety functions. This also eliminates the need for any safety-related human actions or safety-related electrical power sources. Due to the design of the pool-type nature reactor, the traditional containment is replaced with a functional containment design. Utilizing system boundaries for containment strategy provides the large containment buildings we see in current light water reactors. This reduces the amount of concrete needed by the plant by a significant amount, which will also reduce construction time and construction costs. Next slide, please.
So to help develop an age room reactor, TerraPower Terra uses three main mechanisms for knowledge transfer. We utilize personnel who have had previous SFR experience. By reviewing previous SFR design documentations, OE, and then lessons learned, and with strategic partnerships. Uh, next slide. We have many current and past employees with the SF with SFR experience. Uh, pre a previous SFR plant manager, fuel system designers, commissioning leads, operators, and core designers. My mentor was Denny Newland, a longtime FFTF employee who worked his way up through the operations of that plant to the plant managing. We have had several other people with great SFR experience as well, including John Truax, Dave Lukoff, Craig Smith, and Owen Nelson. These are just a few of the people on our project who have worked in pre previous SFR projects. These individuals help to retain the knowledge of the past by providing mentorship with junior engineers to ensure they have a clear understanding of SFR design and control principles. This mentoring is vital to ensure knowledge is turned over to the next generation of engineers in the sodium reactor field. These experts also provide direct input into design through developing systems and providing expertise on various design elements. And they also document strategies used from pre previous SFRs that can apply to the natrium, including operational design strategies and commissioning strategies. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another avenue of knowledge transfer the Nature and Project utilizes is the use of historical documentation. TerraPower has a repository of historical records from SFRs such as FFTF, EBR2, Super Phoenix, and others. This includes design documents, operating experience, and lessons learned. Next slide. Nature and engineers use this information to help develop the systems they are designing. These documents give engineers a good basis for the system design, provides them information on past challenges and their solutions, and a wealth of operating experience and lessons learned. This historical information is key to ensuring the design is based on solid data and provide the ability to better model plant systems. Uh, examples include, as you can see, the leak in the Phoenix IHX and the changes made to prevent the recurrence. Next slide. The modified design of the PFR air, dam, air dump uh, air heat exchanger to improve reliability and efficient, efficiency. Next slide. And also the redesign of the thermal couple well at Manju to prevent flow induced vibration leaks. These are only a few examples of many that have been utilized in the designing of plant systems. Next slide. The final method of knowledge transfer that TerraPower uses is strategic partnerships. TerraPower has partnered with Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, Idaho National Laboratories, and JAEA to help provide historical documentation and SFR experts. The organization also provides input into design reviews to ensure the plant is on track and has a good technical basis. With these partnerships, the Natrium design process is more efficient and complete. The TerraPower process of utilizing the past will help us to realize the future. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank Tricia and all the organizers for setting this up and inviting me, and also for all the panelists and their efforts in preserving the knowledge for sodium fast reactors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much, Patrick, uh, for the for the presentation. We're running a little bit late, so Berta is going to announce uh, the upcoming webinar, and then uh, everyone who can, I would like you to show your face for the Q and A session. Excuse me. Our upcoming webinar presentation from July: Off Gas Xenon Detection and Management in Support of MSRs. August: Corrosion and Cracking of SCWR Materials. And in September, a presentation by EPRI virtual uh, on the EPRI virtual reality training. Thank you very much, uh, Berta. So uh, we have a series of, of questions. I just see myself. I don't know if uh, Hiroki or Carl or Patrick wants to, voila, some of us 
have the possibility to show the face. Uh, we have received uh, 14, 15 questions. So we're gonna go through. Um, uh, we First one uh, is uh, for Joel. Joel, I hope you're still with us through your phone. Uh, is there any difference between safety in Russian BN600, BN800 with ESFR Smart? Uh, do we still have, do we have uh, <laughs> Joel still with yes. us, Bertha, or not? Yes, I'm yes, yes I know you, yes. Okay, did you, you hear me? Yes. Can you uh, re repeat the question, please? Yes, yes. Let me go back to my word file that I put all the questions together. <laughs> is, <laughs> and with a French accent. <laughs> Is there is there any difference between safety in Russian BN six hundred BN eight hundred with ESFR Smart? Yes, there's difference in safety uh, in safety rules since the Fukushima accident, and um, the new we apply the new rules of uh, after Fukushima. Uh, particularly, we apply new rules for the mitigation of accidents because now we have to consider, even if you take all the possibilities to avoid accidents, we are obliged by the safety authorities to apply the, um, the, the exercise of uh, what arrives with in the bigger in the case of the bigger accident and so the design of the smart is made that allows even in the case hypothetical case of bigger accident big, bigger accident uh, core, core melting and all all we need to have the demonstration that there is no uh, radioactive release out of the plant and so it is the result of the super smart design Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Joel. Uh, the next, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move a little bit the question that everybody has uh, at least one question. Uh, this is for Ron. Are the AFTF lessons learned available to the public? Uh, I'm off mute now, I believe. Okay, I would, um, if people wish to get them, I would start with a paying customer. Uh, which is the Office of Nuclear Energy. And I would go to Frank Goldner uh, to find out who to contact there. Frank has been in the Office of Nuclear Energy forever, knows everybody there. Uh, let me say that they contain export control information, so we would have to work a bit uh, to make them available, depending on who's requesting them. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Ron. A question for Iwoki. Did you can... Okay, there's some sound. If you can mute yourself, I will help. Uh, Iwoki, did Japan yes. give up the JSFR development? Uh, yes, uh, JSFR development is uh, uh, ended. But uh, uh, this year, Japanese government decided to uh, develop the demonstration reactors. And uh, maybe uh, this summer, that pro project will be start. So a uh, new project will be uh, started in the near, very, very near future. That is the okay. situation in Japan. Okay, thank you very much, Iwaki. Uh, Carl, a question for you. Where do you plan to get your uranium metal feedstock and reach to 13% plus uh, in uranium-235? This is the major question for all small modular reactors requiring HALU fuel. Uh, with the Ukrainian conflict and the elimination of Russia through the supply chain, there's intense activities going on both in the US and Canada to source HALU right now. Uh, there are multiple streams being developed. 
So I can't give you a specific one. Uh, it's right now it's in, in development. Okay, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, Patrick, what is the emergency planning zone for natrium reactor? So the emergency planning zone for the natrium reactor will be at the site boundary. So it won't extend out past the owner controlled area. Uh, currently, that's assessed at about 400 meters, uh, but whenever we get the final calculations done, we'll have an exact number. Uh, so it's pr primarily at the owner-controlled area to where it doesn't go out into any public spaces. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joel, um, yeah. yes? Yes. Jo Joel, there's a question for you. What is the megawatt ton? megawatt electric size of the ESFR smart design? The um, ESFR smart design was 1,300 megawatt, electrical megawatt. It was the result of the studies with the Super Phoenix that was 1,200. And it's the reason of the very big power. And as Nobody will today build directly the big director. It's a reason that the new program, OSFR Simple, is working on reactor of lower power. And uh, actually, we arrived to have a reactor of 400 uh, thermal megawatts in a primary vessel of 9 meters of diameter. And so this type of reactor could be a very nice prototype because it can be built in, in a factory. With a nine meter diameter, it's possible to build all the reactors in factory and it will be the prototype for an eventual new uh, sodium fat reactor in, in Europe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Iroki, for the JAEA sodium handling training, you said that it was open for the world. How do we participate? We, yes, uh, I don't know the exactly, but uh, uh, in the Tsuruga area, uh, I will send the uh, information for that. So please give me an email for that. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, on the slides um, that you will get the PDF file that you can download, you have the email address of each presenter, so feel free to contact them and they will be happy to answer any question you may have. Uh, I have a question for Ron. Ron, will U.S. continue the SFR development by utilizing the FFTF technologies? Uh, say say again one more time, Patricia. Yes. Will the U.S. continue the SFR development by utilizing the FFTF technologies? Um, well, we hope so. That's the reason we're preserving it, okay? Uh, and as you heard from uh, uh, Cal and Patrick, okay, uh, they have access some of it, probably not all of it and are using it as, as, as they incorporate it into their design. So yes, we, the answer is we hope so. Okay, very good. Uh, this one, uh, it's for Patrick. Patrick, how does the natrium reactor ensure that no personal access will be required in the reactor bay for any maintenance, surveillance, or other corrective actions when it is located underground like that? So the uh, reactor is located underground, but the head access area, which is above, there is accessible at power for short periods of time. We are ensuring there's enough shielding in there to allow access for a short periods of time, less than an hour, so people can get access to any of the uh, equipment on the top of the head of the reactor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joel, what is yes. the current cost estimate of SFR using ESFR Simple? 
the cost of the SFR using the SFR, uh, I think the costs are reduced uh, in comparison of the old design, uh, especially for the secondary loops, we reduce the cost of 50% for the secondary loops. And also it's possible to have two reactors uh, with the same uh, handling building. And those at this point will reduce also the cost in comparison of the old design. And uh, in the primary part, we have suppressed the safety vessel and we have suppressed the dome or the system uh, above the core uh, in case of, uh, of severe accident. And so we have also made some cost, uh, cost uh, uh, better cost of the primary. Uh, so I think that now with this design, uh, this type of factor can reach uh, uh, 20%, they uh, can uh, reach almost the cost of the, the water reactor. But we have also this always this problem of prototypes that are more costly that the reactor built in a series. So it's difficult to give a final cost for the first reactor. Okay, and there's a subsequent question to this one, Joel. How does yes. it compare with the future molten chloride fast reactor under development by Terra Power ah. and Moltex Energy? Yes. The molten, uh, I work also on the molten, uh, molten chloride uh, salt reactor. And um, the problem of the molten salt chloride reactor is that there's a lot of things that are not well known on the final cost and on the materials. And so we speak today of cost with a reactor that is not well uh, known is difficult. The, we hope that the molten salt reactor will be uh, cheaper, but uh, uh, we have no uh, final design of this reactor with uh, good materials, and so it's difficult to know the, the cost today. Mm -hmm. We hope the molten salt reactor should be uh, low at, at lower cost, especially for the cycle of the fuel because uh, we have not to build to extract the used fuel and to extract after by reprocessing the produce and to build a new fuel uh, element. Mm -hmm. In the most of the reactor, you can, you don't need that. So you can save a lot of money in the cycle of the fuel. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, I think this is for the three first presenters who presented lessons learned. Uh, the question is, how do we get our hands on these lessons learned documents? So Ron told you that preferentially you may contact uh, uh, Frank Goldner at the OE Office of Nuclear Energy. I, I know that we have uh, uh, Joel with different books, but still, I'm asking the three of you, Ron, Iwoki, and, uh, and uh, Joel, how do we get our hands on these lessons learned documents? For the, for the books, <laughs> we can find the books on, on the site of Elsevier on, on, or on the site of Amazon. So there is no problem to get the books. Uh, and the references I've given uh, are also available uh, easily. The, the webinar of last year uh, on SFR Smart and also the dedicated ASM uh, publication. You have the reference in my uh, presentation and <coughs> it's easy to obtain this reference. Yes. Uh, um, one, I, I, you, I, I, yes, one. Add, yeah, Patricia. Frank Goldner may not be the final decider there, but okay. Frank is always a good place to start whenever you okay. want to talk to any. Okay, very good. And uh, Iwoki? Yes, uh, in case of JEEA, uh, some reports uh, were opened uh, for the, in, uh, in the internet site, um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, maybe half of them are Japanese language. Uh, but uh, uh, 
some of the, them are opened, but uh, not all. So in, uh, in case of a closed uh, report, uh, it uh, should be need some uh, contract or su such kind of things. Okay, and I have a, another question very similar for you, Iwoki. How can we get more information about Arcadia? Arcadia, uh, maybe Arcadia is uh, in an international conference. Uh, we have uh, many, many uh, pre presentations. So maybe uh, you you can search the uh, some uh, international conference. Okay, and, and maybe we will have a webinar on Arcadia. Mm -hmm. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Is it uh, and and this is again for you, um, um, Iroki? Is it natural language processing AI tool? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that AI tool is uh, included in the Arcadia, and uh, uh, after the uh, calculation, uh, we should have some decision uh, compared to the uh, criteria. So. In, uh, and the optimization. In the optimization, we use uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, for optimization. Uh, that is a uh, 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 main cause of the Arcadia. Okay, very good. Um, a question probably for each one of you. Have technology readiness level assessments be done on SFR? And if yes, can we see the report? Somebody wants to answer? I will say yes. <laughs> and I'm not sure that the reports can be made public. Uh, I do know they're included with our licensing documents. So when we actually get to a licensing stage, they will be made public. Okay, thank you. For me, the, the, the technology is available. If you read the book on Phoenix, the Super Phoenix, something like that, you see that, uh, what, what was the mistake, what was the problem. And now the technology is available because we know the materials that can be used. We have the instrumentation necessary and we have all that is available to build this type of reactor. The problem is not uh, technique for technological for me. The problem is political and the problem is the cost. Okay, very good. Uh, I have uh, a question for each one of you. Please provide your opinion on the optimum size of an SFR. Was SPX too large or are SMRs too small? For me, we need to begin with a, with a small SFR, because nobody will begin with a reactor of uh, one of uh, one thousand megawatt. The Super Phoenix was one thousand two hundred megawatt, but it was after Phoenix and after Rhapsody. Now, if we restart the SFR, we need to begin with a prototype of about uh, two hundred or three hundred megawatt. And when the prototype will operate, we can begin the, 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 the decision to make a bigger reactor. Nobody will directly go to a reactor of more than 1,000 megawatts. You see the Russian people, they have the 600 megawatts after they build the 800 megawatts. And the next project is the Ben Dusan, Ben 1,200 megawatts. You see, there is a chain. And you can not begin directly with a reactor of more of, of about uh, 1,000 megawatts. You need to make the prototype before. For okay, me. very good. Very good. Uh, someone else wants to add something? Yes. Uh, yes. For, for, from the viewpoint of the uh, power generation cost, uh, larger is the better. The larger is the better. And uh, uh, for the competitiveness uh, with the uh, right water reactor, maybe it needs uh, uh, over one tera uh, gigawatt uh, uh, like that. But uh, uh, it's 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 have, uh, another uh, function uh, that uh, MA burning, uh, minor oxygen burning or 
uh, radioactive waste uh, treatment. So, uh, in case of that uh, function, maybe uh, as a uh, cost uh, competitiveness will be uh, we can uh, consider. I think so. Okay, very good. Someone wants to add something? Can I can add something. Uh, yes, please, Patrick. Uh, so, as for the size of an SMR, um, I think it really depends on the application that you're working with. Uh, in a more remote area, you would probably want a smaller uh, SFR, but in a bigger area, you'd want a, a larger one. What we've noticed is due to government regulations, uh, no matter how small you make an SMR, it's still going to be required to have certain things be done at that plant, security, um, training, staffing. Uh, to operate the plant, and uh, smaller the megawatts you have at a single site, the uh, larger the cost burden is on that smaller reactor. So uh, I think uh, getting the regulations changed for these safer ones are important in order to make the smaller ones more economical, and getting people to understand that the passive safety of these SFRs are a lot safer than LWR, so they don't need as many of those requirements so we can get those smaller ones to be economical with a good staffing size. Okay, very good. Um, yes, please, Khan. So, uh, it, like like Hiroki said, it all depends on, on what your application is. Now, the, the one thing, uh, the easy math is the bigger, the lower your levelized cost of electricity. You can have a bigger reactor for less, uh, materials and less but the economy of repetition is much more powerful than the economy of size if you're making small units and you're repeating them over and over and over again your economies are incredibly more powerful so making one big unit will be much more expensive than 10 small ones yes Thank you very much. I, I have a last question because I see it's 7.32. So, and thank you everyone to, to stay with us. Uh, one question for Joel. Did France yes. give up the Astrid project and its collaboration with Japan? The Astrid project was stopped. And uh, now there is, there, is, there is some collaborative work with Japan. But I don't know the status today of this collaborative work. But uh, the project Astrid himself is uh, stopped and will not will will not restart. Okay, very good. And I saw uh, someone saying it would prove helpful to provide reference O E L L. No idea what it is. O E L L source hyperlinks to participants. So we'll try to see and how to help with the GIF website if we can put a list of these uh, references. Uh, with that, I think uh, I would like to thank uh, our speakers today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carl, Patrick, Hiroki, Joel, and Ron. It was a pleasure uh, to have you. Uh, thank you for all the people who stayed with us. The webinar is recorded, will be available on the GIF uh, platform and we see you in a month uh, for the next webinar i wish you all a good day a good night thank you very much thank you berta also for uh, helping us with all of the technical difficulty we had thank you everyone have a good day thank you patricia Merci. bye bye you, everyone bye 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 everyone bye <laughs>